Time now for sports on 104.7 The Cave. Here's Ned Reynolds. Mike, the intern, Ned Reynolds in the studio. Thank God it's Friday. So two weeks ago, maybe a little bit less than that, um, we had a conversation about the Cardinals going to London. And a lot of writers were saying, you know, this is going to be a really, really key series for the team because it's going to be a situation where we're going to see is it buy or sell or nothing nothing here we are two weeks later and we're in the same probably worse situation what's the future of Cardinals two games baseball? less uh, under 500 than they used to be and that by less I don't mean positively they are 15 games under the 500 mark you have to get to 500 before you can even consider any kind of chance of playing for a championship that's just really the nature of the game well, the Cardinals have 75 games remaining in the season, and they are 15 under 500. One last night, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Many of the baseball pundits around the country are saying the Cardinals really need to consider selling. And interestingly enough, among the names that are being mentioned are Jack Flaherty and Jordan Montgomery. And I say interesting, it's really not all that surprised because both of those guys are free agents at the end of the season. Now, might they sign with the Cardinals again? Yeah, they might. Flaherty was particularly good last night. Montgomery probably going against the Chicago White Sox this weekend in Chicago. But the Cardinals really have reached a point in their schedule now, the All-Star break, where you have, starting on Sunday, days off. Monday, Tuesday, and Tuesday is the All-Star game. Wednesday, Thursday, and resume play on Friday. (laughs) <laughs> when you're idle like that, there's a lot of talking that will take place. I wouldn't be surprised if the Cardinals do make a deal. They did send Matt Libertor back to the minor leagues. That in and of itself is something of a surprise since Libertor was a member of their starting rotation but has been very much less than impressive. So he goes back for some minor league work, hopefully, and we'll see if that results in itself. But did the Cardinals make a deal this coming week? week ahead. We're still two weeks away from the trading deadline, but hey, something's got to be done. Something's got to give, man. We've got so much baseball left. It's too too early. In, uh, no, I don't want to say too early in the season. We're at the halfway point, but still, there's so much baseball left. It's not a good thing to be down like this for <laughs> three months or two months, whatever it is. Ladies playing golf at Pebble Beach right now um, while some of the guys are across the pond here soon. U.S. Women's Open Tournament has begun. It has indeed, and this is one of the biggies, if not the biggest one on the LPGA Tour. But there are many who are LPGA players, that's the Ladies Professional Golf Association, who are not from the United States. The leader is Zi Yu Lin, who is a veteran from China. I say veteran, she's played on the LPGA Tour for nine years now and never gotten a win. Been in the money, yes, but never had a win. She's the leader at a four under par at Pebble Beach. That's very good. Now, the rest of the field is very closely bunched and anything can happen out on that course. But uh, the fact is that there are any number of outstanding golfers playing. Michelle Wee, who 20 years ago was one of the big up and coming United States stars. (laughs) This is her last tournament. She has announced her retirement. She's married now. Michelle Wee West is her name, and she's going to hang it up after this one. But, boy, that, that, that makes you feel old because you remember when she was a kid out there on the tour and just getting underway, and here she is going to retire. But anyway, be that as it may, Yu Lin is the first-round leader by one stroke. Priorities, my man, priorities. Uh, speaking of which, while you're talking about what's going on with the uh, Women's Open right now, did the Saudis go after any of these ladies for the live tour to that work? There, They're just there men is only. no, no live tour for the ladies. <laughs> just curious. Team USA has been revealed for the upcoming World Cup competition. And do we get any big name pros on this team? It, everything's relative. Are they big names? Uh, really? That's not, no, that's not the case. Are they good players? Oh, absolutely. They're all NBA players and some pretty good ones. Paolo Banchero is the interesting one. He is from the Orlando Magic. Uh, Banchero had a really, really good rookie year in the NBA. He's from Duke. He had the opportunity to play for Team Italy since his dad is Italian. But he's born and raised in the United States. Went to Duke, obviously. 
And he said, nope, I'm going to play for the USA. So that he will be one of the strong members. Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson from the Brooklyn Nets. Tyrese Halliburton from the Indiana Pacers. Austin Reeves. He's the kid from the Los Angeles Lakers who, while the Lakers got blown out by uh, in the NBA playoffs and, and really <laughs> handled by the Denver Nuggets, Reeves was outstanding. He's a great long-distance shooter, kid from Wichita State first and then Oklahoma second. He's on the team, and there's several others. Big names, no, not headline names at all. Interesting because the competition they're going up against, while it is universal, is going to be pretty tough because all these countries have NBA players of their own right. We'll see how things work out and whether or not the USA can qualify for the Olympics. I think they already have, being the Olympic gold medalist. But the World Cup is second to the Olympics mm-hmm. and a very important piece of your basketball hardware, so to speak. You know, obviously we want Team USA to win, and anything we can do to win is great. But at the same time, you kind of like to see the playing field get a little bit even. It's come a long way since the early 90s dream team where they just dominated the entire world. And so, Cardinals... Nothing going right for that team right now. Yeah, the last night was a different story. They did win last night, and the final game of their four-game series with Miami, the Cardinals win in most un-Cardinals-like way. They shut out the Miami Marlins. (laughs) When the Cardinals win, it's usually 10-9 or 14-13 or something like this because they're pitching in very good. But it was last night, and Jack Flaherty is the individual who really began to fashion the shutout. He had two relievers down the stretch. But this was a close game. Nothing, nothing in the sixth inning. Nolan Arnato stuck one in the right center field seats to start things off. Cardinals got a run there, added two more late in the game. Flaherty pitched very well. He went six and two-thirds innings for the Cardinals, allowed nine hits but no runs. That's pretty interesting. question is, was Flaherty being showcased for uh, somebody else? And Miami hit the ball, hit the ball very well. But the fact of the matter remains, they could not get any runs across, and the Cardinals are the winners by a score of 3 nothing. Now head to Comiskey Park, or what used to be Comiskey Park in Chicago, to play the White Sox this weekend. Then it's the All-Star break, and we'll stay tuned to see if there's any rumblings going on during that All-Star break. How about the other teams in Missouri? How are they doing? Well, the Kansas City Royals lose again. Cleveland Guardians beat them last night 6-1. to Springfield Cardinals playing very well. Their overall record for the entire season is now even. 39 wins, 39 losses. But their record in the second half is above 500. Redbirds, uh, Springbirds, I should say, won last night over the Amarillo Sod Poodles 5-3. They'll play again tonight, tomorrow night, and then Sunday afternoon, ending that homestand. They're getting along pretty well. They're uh, playing well as a team and cohesive baseball is really what you're looking for, and, and that's what the Cardinals are. At least we got some bright spots. <laughs> 25th anniversary of the highest scoring All Star baseball game ever today. When was it and where? It was in 1998, and they played where else? Coors Field in Denver, and the American League won it by a score of 13 to 8. That's the highest scoring All Star game in history, and that was 25 years ago tonight. Ball always flies at Coors Field, and it was that night as well. Ned, you have a wonderful weekend. Stay hydrated, and I will see you on Monday.